She walked up the subway steps, pulling the comb from her back pocket. The cigar shop on the corner was still open, selling Sunday papers. And she used its window to take the point out of her DA and to dismantle her pompadour. She whistled Brenda Lee's I'm sorry, softly as she wound small spit curls in front of her ears. I didn't understand what the difference my difference was. About junior high, the boys started calling me Butch. I was obviously queer. I was one of the only Jewish kids growing up in a town that was very wasp. I was a very lonely kid. I had two little kids and a husband. And I, there's so many women in my generation who did likewise. I fell into books like you fall into a river. I would just disappear into them. It was the place I could hide. And literally, I would hide. You could read stories about working class people and poor people, and they were always kind of maudlin. Um, and the, they were good, inherently good. We weren't, and I knew this. We were violent, uh, angry, addicted to liquor and drugs and bad behavior. The black arts movement was very influential for me. You didn't go to any kind of rally or march without a poet or a singer kicking things off. I remember being a sophomore in college and hearing about the first uh, consciousness raising meeting and the first, um, you know, baby gatherings of lesbians and feminists. It was just, it was like the world began to crack open. At 15, my best friend and I fell in love. While the adults went to the bars, the kids went to the ice cream parlor, that sort of thing. That's also where we found our first lesbian pulps. You could take a book home and under the covers at night with an, a flashlight or something, you could, you could enter a world. It was scary. It was not a friendly time. You could lose your children. You could lose your job. Your friends would turn against you. The sense that you were sick, the sense that there was no hope unless you lived with the, a facade of a normal life, the sense that you were a menace to little children, you were a child abuser just by, by living. When I was coming up, it was illegal to be queer and to practice homosexual sex. You can never take it for granted that it might well go back to that again. We were trying to tell stories of people in love. We were being sabotaged by the post office because this stuff was going through the mail and they didn't want happy endings because otherwise Congress would be on their case. There has never been a separation in my life between my identity, not just as a lesbian, but as a particularly difficult, provocative, angry, working class lesbian. I wanted to find the stories that were about my people and give me some sense of purpose and meaning and some way to fight the shame. We were sort of writing the, the cook's tour of what we, we knew. We didn't know that much ourselves, but um, about what was beginning to become the gay and lesbian movement. In order to change the world, you have to first change your dreams. And to me, writing speculative fiction, those are my dreams. The acquisitions editor said, your character is black, a lesbian, and a vampire. That's too confusing. And I'm thinking, who do you think your market is gonna be, like two-year-olds? I was working on um, stories that were Frankly, openly lesbian stories, they had lesbian sex, and then they were butch femme. Several agents rejected the book. Uh, they said, well, we're uncomfortable with the sexuality. We don't quite understand the sexuality. It's lesbian sexuality, you know? What's not to understand? It was a, a long, hard road. And, um, and here we are, and there's, we're still on the, on the journey. But it's a little bit helpful to know that someone started beating the ground down for you. She maintained a slow pace, moving south, then west to the edge of the city. 
enjoying the evening air and the memory of the girl's soft, pale skin. Her resurgent dreams cast a new glow on Gilda's life. In giving dreams, she had recaptured her own.